everybody. Welcome back to the Prairie Puck Boys podcast. We are here once again uh, with, I don't know where, I'm, where am I on your screen, Mike? Top left. All right, to my top left, uh, or sorry, to my right, I don't know, is Michael Cake and Tyler Verloop is here. My name is Joshua Schooning. We are have a special guest this week. We are joined by the host of Canes This Week, as well as morning show host and promotions director at Clear Sky Radio. We have Jordan Karst here with, with us today. How's it going, Jordan? Good. Thanks, guys, for having me. So uh, in today's podcast, we're going to talk a little bit about grades for each Canadian team this season. But before we get into that, let's get to know Jordan a little bit more. So uh, Jordan, let's start with our first question here. Uh, can you talk about some of the things you do for Clear Sky Radio and for the Lethbridge Hurricanes? Uh, yeah, uh, I've been working with uh, CJOC in Lethbridge now for 13 years, something like that. I started as a producer there doing commercials and have worked my way up to being the morning show host for the last six years. Uh, I'm also temporary program director right now while our program director is away. Uh, so radio, been a passion of mine for a long time. I took the program at the college and graduated back in 2005. For the Hurricanes, I've been an in-game host off and on for uh, the last six or seven years now. And I also host a weekly Canes This Week podcast, and we have a lot of great guests on. J GM Peter Anholt comes down and joins us. Brent Kissio has been down. I'll be all the coaches. I mean, we have a lot of fun with that. And uh, yeah, a lot of local media and stuff comes by and does it too. So it's kind of a rundown of it all. And can you kind of talk about who your favorite person to interview on Canes This Week has been so far? That's absolutely without a doubt peter anholt um i mean not just because he's the gm it's because of the kind of gm he is he's very open he's very honest we get some great great answers out of him and uh he's he's willing to just come down talk and talk very very openly about the team so is uh, uh dustin forbes like a regular um person to join you on those segments yeah. Yeah, because I mean, it's it's nice to have somebody down here that can fill time, and so the play-by-play -play guys they can definitely do that. And uh, not that he's not also very knowledgeable about what's going on, but I mean, <laughs> throw him the question, and five minutes later you can you know be wrapping up his answer and have the next one ready to go. But yeah, Forbes he's on probably every two or three shows. He's probably our most regular guest. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, can you uh, tell us a little bit about other things you have been involved in in sports? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up playing. I loved hockey, loved tennis growing up. And then once I moved to college here, I didn't do a whole lot. It just didn't seem that I had a whole lot of time for it or, or you know, I was busy doing other things. Um, and then I became the in-game host of the Kindersley Junior Clippers in Saskatchewan. I went to work for a radio station there. And I really, really liked being on the mic in the crowd and giving out prizes and things like that which naturally led to me trying to get it when I came here to Lethbridge. Um, I've had some great opportunities. I had a chance to work with the UFC when they came and hosted an event here in Lethbridge, and I got to sit on stage in front of a bunch of fans and interview Jordan Meehan and Dimitri Mighty Mouse Johnson, or Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson. They got to ask questions. I kind of filtered some of them through, did a few other questions of my own, and then, you know, they got up on stage and hosted um, – just kind of some sparring, light sparring, and everybody kind of got to watch. And so that was a really, really cool experience. All right, right on. Uh, so you graduated from the college in 2005 from uh, the then communication arts and broadcast journalism, just like my, uh, my friends and I here are about to graduate from the now digital communication and media program. What was the transition? Pardon me. What was the transition like going, building up that sports reputation in the field? Uh, well, honestly, for me, like I don't do a lot of sports. I do my podcast and stuff. That was, we sat down first day of class. And I mean, I had some of the, Ray was an instructor. George was an instructor. And I know, you know, those guys, we had a couple other instructors as well. And on day one, they sat there and we had a class of 32 kids. And they said, how many of you want to work for TSN? And every single guy and a couple of the girls in the class put their hands up. And they said, one of you might. And I mean, that was, it was, a it was shocking right off the bat because I mean that's you grow up watching sports you want to talk sports you, you love watching hockey games and you know the play-by-play -play is so interesting doing the interviews all that kind of stuff and I mean it was pretty early on in school I realized I, I love sports I'm a sports guy and there were half a dozen to a dozen guys in my class that knew 10 times more about every sport than me I knew my hockey I knew my my CFL, I knew a little NFL. There were guys that knew everything about the NFL, everything about basketball, everything about European soccer. I was just like, 
those are the guys that go on to get those jobs. And so I love music and uh, going to radio was a pretty easy choice, especially playing music all day. So my sports background is more of a passion and less of an ex expertise. Right on. And so um, I once, once, I once went to your house one time to interview on the topic of podcasting. Great setup, by the way. Um, you are a huge LA Kings fan and an even bigger Anze Kopitar fan. Why the Kings and why did you draw such a liking to the Slovenian superstar? Um, honestly, as a, like, I, so I think I was four or five years old when Gretzky got traded to the LA Kings. And I mean, I, at that age, you don't remember a lot from it, but I do remember at that time there was this press conference and this big news store. Where everybody kind of amped about it. And for some reason, I just jumped on. And I, like, I liked them. Their jerseys were cool. I mean, how do you not cheer for Wayne Gretzky, especially when he's in his prime? And then I think I was in grade one or two or something like that. It was, the, well, the year they went to the cup finals against Montreal and my mom's work uh, did a hockey pool. And so my dad drafted the players, but he asked me who I should take and we loaded up on Kings and they went to the final and we ended up winning the hockey pool and that just sealed it for me. Uh, as far as Kopitar goes, the dude's the most underrated stud in the league has been for a long, long time. Uh, he's great offensively. He's even better defensively. He does everything right. And he is now my favorite LA King of all time, surpassing Wayne Gretzky. I mean, oh, wow. he, he's, he's perfect. He's amazing. Right on. And as a follow-up to that, the Kings are going through a rebuild at the moment. I jokingly asked you on Friday how long it would take for them to make it back to the playoffs. I think I would agree with your answer with it being not long due to the fact that they have arguably the strongest prospect pool. Who is your favorite Kings prospect currently, and who are you hoping they nab in this year's draft? Uh, I'll go with this year's draft first. I want them to get Quentin Byfield. Oh, yeah? The Kings, their center depth is really good, and with Kopitar, I agree, but, you know, they've got guys that are aging out. They've got some young guys that haven't exactly proven yet. Gabe Velarde coming up was big and seeing him play, but his health has been a huge question mark since his junior career. Um, so... Quinton Byfield is who I'm hoping to get in the draft. My favorite prospect, probably Tobias Bjornfoot, the defenseman that they drafted uh, last year, I believe it was. And he almost stuck with the team at the start of this year. They had him playing with Drew Doughty in the first few games. I mean, Alex Turcotte's an exciting forward. Kapari, they, like you said, their, their prospect pool is stacked with great offensive talent. And I have watched that team struggle to score goals even when they were with the Stanley Cup. So that's exciting. But just Bjornfoot seems like such a can't-miss good defensive prospect. Definitely. I enjoyed watching them play in the preseason and a little bit of the first few games. As an aside to that, do you think McClellan will be there once the team finally turns it around? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I, think, I think they're out of wild card next year, but like not top five lottery draft pick. And then I think the year after that, they fight for a wild card. And I believe he's got two more on his contract or three on his contract or something as it is. So I think he's there until they're a playoff team. Right on. Right on. I'm just going to jump in there, Tyler, if that's cool. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, we, we had a – was it last week? We had an interesting discussion about a goalie where we see him in the next, I don't know, what did we say, five years? A couple years, yeah. Yeah, in the next well, in the next few years. So, Jordan, where do you see Jonathan Quick in the next five years? Uh, this, is, this is heartbreak for me. Because I love Jonathan Quick. Those playoff performances were amazing. You still watch him to this day, and he is spectacular – at times I think Jonathan Quick has moved I thought with Carter Hart in Philadelphia Jonathan Quick was going to be moved there so that they could run Hart out there 40 games a year and let him you know grow and that Jonathan Quick would be there because you're not putting too much stress on his body if you're only playing him half the season now you've got an old guy who's won two Stanley Cups but still has a couple good years in him if he can and stay healthy leading their next goaltender now Hart took a bigger step than I thought he was going to this year played a lot more games and therefore I think they're ready to kind of just anoint him the goat guy and play him a heavier load so I don't know where Jonathan Quick moves his contract's not bad either like I mean for uh if you're looking at him as a number one guy or a guy that competes I think he's like five and a half mil yeah. and I think his actual um salary is dropping in the next couple years so I, I don't know. That's why I thought him and a young guy would be a great tandem because now you're spending about six, six and a half on your goaltending tandem, which is pretty good. And you've got two guys that you can probably rely on and one to groom a younger guy. So if it's not Philly, 
And I, I, I hate to say that I don't want to see him finish his career in LA. I'd love to personally, but I just, if they're going to grow, they need to grow Cal Peterson. They've got a good young prospect, a couple of good young prospects in goal as well. Jonathan Quick needs to go somewhere with a young starting goaltender. And what do you think happened with him there? Like, do you think he just fell off or he was relying too much on athleticism more so than technical skills? Or what's your opinion on that? No, I, I honestly think what it is, is if you watch his athleticism, it's hard to look at a guy that's played the NHL in the last 15, 20 years and be like, he's, athletic, he's as athletic and as consistent as Jonathan Quick, who can have his bad games. But for the most part, and for those runs, what happened, I think, with that Kings team, 12, 13, 14, they won two Stanley Cups. They went to a Western Conference final. That 14 Stanley Cup, they played three seven-game hard-fought series. And there were, I think, what was it? The World Cup was right around that time. Like, they had guys that were playing a lot of hockey. And Jonathan Quick was one of them. They relied on him as a starter in some of those seasons, especially 12, where he played a ton of games. And I think it just caught up with him a little bit. I, I Like, he's been, he was better this year like health wise, but again, they weren't running him out there as much either. So yeah, I, he gets older and a guy who stretches that much. I don't know. You guys are young. It looks like <laughs> stretch now the way I did was I, when I was in college 15 years yeah. ago, I mean, if I go for a run now, I'm hurting for two days afterwards. Whereas back then it used to be nothing. So your body just gets to, even if you're a top, top end athlete. Definitely. Uh, Mike, did you want to chime in? Yeah, like, did you where where were you when you the Alec Martinez overtime game winner against the Rangers? I was sitting on my couch. It's not in the house I live in now. It was uh, the house my, my wife and I had before that. So I remember that night very very vividly. First of all, it was a Friday the thirteenth, and my co-host and I at the radio station got penned months ahead to uh, uh, to host. It was a relay for life event out in Coldale, I believe. And so we agreed to it, whatever, not knowing that it was going to be game five or game six, whatever it was, the Stanley Cup finals and that the Kings were going to be in it. So I, I sucked it up. I went out there. We hosted. I, I missed the first period. I drove. It's a, police shouldn't be watching this, but a little faster than I should have to get back. In. <laughs> I got there for the second period, third period, and then I ended up watching a one and a half or whatever it was overtime sitting on my couch. And, uh, yeah, I remember exactly where I was when it went in. I remember my wife was sitting right next to me. And I honestly remember, too, if you guys remember the 14 playoff run for the Kings, they went down three games to nothing to San Jose in the first yeah. round. At yep. that time, they became like 121 odds to win the Stanley Cup. So I threw like 40 bucks on them. And, um, oh, yeah. Hey, Max, so that, that was a real – I mean, the Kings' second cup win in three years was fantastic. The gambling win on that was probably a sweep. <laughs> <laughs> right on. So obviously that was a pretty crazy hockey story. What is your yeah. craziest, you would say, sports story you have kind of been a part of? I don't know. Like the UFC thing was crazy because I was sitting at my desk at work and I got a call and I can't remember the woman's name, but she's like, hi, this is so-and-so from the UFC. And I almost had to, I'm sorry, why? Why is the UFC calling me? Because I'm a huge UFC fan. And uh, that was a once-in-a-lifetime experience to get a chance to work for an elite organization like that. I mean, that, that, it's, it's pretty awesome. The gambling story with the Kings, that's pretty good. All right. I was, uh, was I five, six, six or seven years old. I was grade two, I think. And my parents, we had a house in Kimberly, BC, and they had this guy that was working in town. He lived in our basement, and he was from Calgary. And he comes up to my parents and says, hey, I know Jordan's a big Kings fan. They're playing up in Calgary. My family's there. I'm, I've got tickets to the game. Would you let me take your son for the weekend to go watch the Kings play? Now, nowadays, somebody does something like that, and there are a ton of red flags. But back then, like, we knew the guy. Everything was on the up and up. So my parents let me go with this older gentleman to watch a hockey game. And we go to the pregame skate and I'm standing outside in a crowd of people as the LA Kings are coming out. And Wayne Gretzky walks by and he says, guys, I'm busy. I'm packed. I got time for one autograph. He looks at me, points at me and walks over. And I was like, oh, it's so nice to meet you. And he's like, shouldn't you be in school? And I said, well, we're skipping school to come see you. And he's like, all right, this one time. 
And then he, uh, Bruce McNall, who was like his manager, agent, whatever it was at the time, was standing right there. And Wayne's like, I don't have a pen. So Bruce pulls like a gold ink pen out of his jacket pocket and gives it to Wayne. And Wayne signed my 1991 upper deck card, the one where he's got like three slap shots, all like, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember those cards. But anyway, so I've got that card signed. And Wayne Gretzky picked me out of a crowd, time for one autograph, and asked me why I wasn't in school. <laughs> that's crazy. That is, that's pretty sad. That's something, yeah. You want to know what's, to know what's um, crazy? Oh, sorry. The go guy, ahead, yeah. guy I was with forgot his camera at home, so I do not have photographs. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. So, I mean, people hear that story and they think, uh, you're so cool. Yeah. Like, here's the card. I swear it happened. My parents will back me up. The guy will back me up. He apologized to no end when we got back. I should have had a picture. I should have had a picture. <laughs> oh, no kidding. Um, so I correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we did mention that you were the in arena host for the hurricanes. Uh, kind of adding on to that, what's been the most memorable hurricanes moment you've been a part of? Um, being there for some of the playoff runs, I, I'm trying to remember because the years, unfortunately, I, fortunately for hurricanes fans, unfortunately for me, they've had so many playoff runs in the recent memory, at least getting into the playoffs and things like that, that I, like they, they run together. But there was a series they played against Regina. Oh, I, I think I know the, the series you're talking about, too. They brought a bus of Regina fans in. And, like, I, I, it's crazy because I did Hurricanes games back in, like, 2010, I want to say. Maybe 12. I don't know when I started. I started when they were really bad. Like, their 12-win season, I was the end game. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Wednesday night when Everett's in town and they announced the attendance is 1,200 and you know there were 800 people there. Like, that's a rough go of it. But uh, being in some of those playoffs, um, the eight in, in that Pat series, I just remember being so loud. The Hurricanes were playing so well. The hockey was so good. And, I mean, it was just amazing to be a part of. Um, having a chance this year to step on the ice, Dylan Cousin and Kaylin Addison, their first game back after winning gold at the World Juniors. We did a post-game interview with them down on the ice. And I mean, standing there, you, looking out at a crowd and seeing how many fans stuck around. They didn't bolt for the exit as soon as the game was over. Everybody wanted to hear what these kids had to say. So, I mean, standing on the ice interviewing Dylan Cousins and Kaylin Addison and talking about them winning World Junior gold the week before, that was pretty cool as well. Where do those two rank in, like, your all-time favorite Canes players over the years? It's tough because, like, I look at favorites a little bit differently. Um, you know, high-end talent. I, I, I would say, and I mean, I wasn't here through the early 90s. I didn't grow up here, stuff like that. Like, some of those teams, I was at the 89 team that uh, went to the Mem Cup or whatever it was, or 96 team. Anyways. Though I, I, didn't, I didn't see those teams. I knew a little bit about them. I came to a couple games when I was in college, but not a lot. And then since I came back, the radio station I worked at used to have the rights, so I knew a lot of the players on the team and was around in a little bit. But like Dylan Cousins, to me, is the best hockey player the Lethbridge Hurricanes organization has ever had. And, I mean, he's the highest draft pick. When you watch him play, He's just simply better than everybody. You hear the term man amongst boys all the time. He literally looks like a man amongst boys on the ice. And there's time where he turns it up, a big guy with a physical f frame. And if he wants to go faster than you, you can't slow him down. And that is just amazing to see his, his skill, his hand, eye. 15 years old and that guy's scoring overtime goals or sorry, uh, uh, late game goals to send it to overtime against Medicine Hat in the playoffs as a 15 year old. Those guys don't touch the ice. I mean, and he's out there scoring. Like, Dylan Cousins, probably the best Hurricane ever. Personal favorite, Carter Banks. He's, uh, he's from Marysville, B.C. Like, I actually played high school tennis with his sister. My brother and Carter played on the same, you know, uh, Timbits teams and stuff like that growing up. Carter Banks. And then I got to give a shout-out to a guy who's helped me a lot in the podcast world. He's also won a Mem Cup with the Vancouver Giants, Mike Wachterl. Mike Wachterl, just a, a great guy, and he was also a fantastic fan favorite for the Hurricanes. There's a Sorry, I cut you off. What did you say? There's a couple. I, 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 you know, I know you asked for my favorite, but there's, there's a few for you. Definitely. Um, for Dylan Cousins, do you think he will return next season, or do you think he's a Buffalo Sabre through and through? No, I think he's going to be back here with the Hurricanes. No offense. 
They have a, uh, they, they've got some depth in Buffalo. Now, I'm going to preface this by saying Pete Anholt was on my year-end show for the Canes this week. He said he fully expects Dylan Cousins to be back here next year. I don't know what inside information he has or doesn't have, but I do know that he knows a whole lot more than I do. Dustin Forbes, their play-by-play guy, expects him back. The, the big argument seems to be, do you, is Buffalo good enough next year for him to make a difference or to, to, to be a big part of that team? And is he good enough to be a second or a third line guy where you're not wasting him as a fourth liner, burning a year of his entry level contract, having him maybe as a healthy scratch some nights? Like, does he, does he jump high enough on that depth chart next year? Or do you send him back to Lethbridge where he's probably the captain of this team for an entire percent? He, he may be the captain of a world junior team that plays for Canada in Alberta over the holidays and uh, have a chance to win a gold medal. And if Dylan Cousins, if you look at Addison, Coltrane Wilson, Ty Prefontaine, like you're losing some high end guys, the Hurricanes are. But look at how good their young guys were this year, mm-hmm. how good they're going to be next year. Pete's a wheeler and a dealer. He's got an open 20 spot. Looks like they're going to get Oliver Ocular back. They're going to have Cam Bites as another 20. And then you go out and find a 20 year old defenseman that can help stabilize things to replace Prefontaine or Wilson. You've got a very, very good hockey team. You've got two young goalies that are another year older that have been working together in tandem for a while now. I mean, I think the Buffalo Sabres look at Dylan Cousins coming back to Lethbridge as having much more upside as him playing a year in the NHL next year. Now, yeah. go ahead. Cousins comes back from the World Juniors, and we all thought he was an amazing hockey player going there. Somehow he comes back and he's even better. Watching him come into this season – we knew how good he was. And in preseason and early season, he looked better than we thought. That's Dylan Cousins is an incredible talent. And there's nothing that's going to – I'm not going to definitively say that he doesn't do enough over this season to be a second-line center with the Buffalo Sabres next year. I, it's a long shot, but I'm not putting anything – I'm not taking anything out of the equation with Dylan Cousins. But I do expect him back in Lethbridge. Yeah. I think that would be the best scenario for him as well, just because Buffalo's ruined – well, I wouldn't say ruined, but they've delayed the development of, like, Alex Nylander – I think uh, middle stack got sent down this year event somewhere yep. at some point. I wouldn't risk it with him. I'd let him, like you said, world juniors in Alberta, potentially captain. I think the Canes team's going to mature. They had a lot of good 17 year olds, like you mentioned. Um, you don't think Addison will be back? He'll be a 20, right? Addison's gone next year. Yeah. He'll, he'll be AHL. Then. Playing AHL hockey. Yeah. Okay. Um, actually, actually that would lead into my next question pretty well. Did you think this year's squad had what it took to potentially win the WHL title? At the start of the year or at the, when we wrap things up? Um, at the end, when you guys wrap things up. I mean, at the start, there were so many question marks going in and nobody knew where the offense was going to come from, how deep this team was going to be, and then they surprised everybody. Um, I, I don't think I, – I don't think roster-wise they were the best roster in the WHL, but from a way they played on the ice and – Look, like I've seen enough WHL playoffs where a lot of those teams get in are very, very close. What separates the teams that are able to push further is either a great amount of depth scoring or a top end that's so high that other teams can't compete. A top end like Brent Davis, Dylan Cousins, Oliver Ocula. I mean, there's, there's a lot of teams that as a whole roster look as good or bad better than the Hurricanes, but there's not a lot that can put a top three like that out. I mean, your top two defensemen, Prefontaine and Wilson, 20-year-olds who can control and shut down a game, Addison and Cotton and the offensive ability. I mean, there were so many game breakers on the Hurricanes this year that I think they would have done very well in a playoff format. And over a seven-game series, I think it would have been tough for anybody to beat them. I don't know that they would have gone to the Mem Cup and been WHL champs, but I think they had a three or four series run in them. Definitely. And I guess that with that Mem Cup anecdote that you mentioned, um, what were your feelings when the Canes lost out to Kelowna and the hosting the Memorial Cup a couple years ago? I really didn't agree with it at the time, and surely it looks like Kelowna it wasn't prepared this year. Yeah. I, it goes a few different ways. Um, I, I would have loved to see Lethbridge get it. I thought they had a great pitch. My concern going in was – the WHL had hosted three Memorial Cups in recent memory. One was in Regina, one was in Red Deer, I believe, and one was in Saskatoon. And all of those are Eastern Conference teams. So when it came down to the Hurricanes vying against two Western Conference teams, I really thought 
that that meant a lot against that was stacking against them a little bit. Also, though, I mean, the Hurricanes is a community-owned team. It's, uh, it's really tough when you don't have a private owner who's got money to guarantee to the league that you're going to be able to sell a certain amount of tickets. You're going to be able – and if you can't sell those tickets, if you can't make that money, the owner puts up, you know, basically a, a guarantee on his end saying, we will have this money. Um, the Hurricanes also – I mean, the community support now is pretty fantastic behind the Hurricanes. But – Going back just a few years ago when they were in that bid, I mean, there were still some doubters because of the rough seasons that they'd had. So I don't know how much that stuff plays into it, but I, I wasn't overly shocked when the Hurricanes didn't get it, but I was upset. All right, Josh, just, Mike, anything? Just going back to Gretzky, do you think Ovechkin's going to catch him for the goal lead? No, and I mean, part of me is, is biased in saying that, obviously. Like, I, I like Ovechkin. I didn't until he won a cup. And I had him in a hockey pool, and he won me that playoff pool. And then he partied all summer like a rock star, and I, I found a lot of love for Alex Ovechkin. I just – what is it? He's got to have five more 50-goal seasons or something like that to catch Gretzky, or he's got to average like five – like it's something like that, right? Like, yeah, it's three or four. I mean, if he, – he's got a shot, obviously. I just – I don't see it happening. It, that's – that's he's getting older, and uh, there's there's – all the training and stuff you can do in the world, but at some point you just start to slow down. Maybe, maybe he'll prove me wrong. Maybe he's got the found in a youth, but I don't think he catches him. Yeah, especially with this season being shut down when it was extra games that he couldn't get those goals. I think he definitely kind of lost a couple goals there. So I don't think he will either personally. Um, but another question is, do you prefer Crosby or Ovechkin? I'm a Crosby guy. Um, Again, like I, I've come a long way on Ovechkin. If you had asked me that three years ago, I hated Ovechkin. I thought he doesn't, you know, I mean, obviously he's a great hockey player, but he just doesn't deserve the accolades he gets. And since then I've changed a little bit on that. But I mean, look at what Sidney Crosby has done, man. I mean, when, when Canada needed him to step up, he scored arguably the biggest goal in Canadian hockey history, probably second to Paul Henderson, but it's up there. I mean, that goal in Vancouver was just – Best, your, your best players have to be your best players when you need them to be their best, and he is. He's a consummate professional. He's, I, I love the way he plays the game, and uh, he's done a lot of real impressive things over his career, and I just, I've always been a Crosby fan. And All one, right. oh, sorry, Mike, do you want to go ahead? One question that's more for us, for us Flames slash Oilers fans. Game, seven game series, who do you have winning Flames Oilers? Right now? Right now. Edmonton Oilers. Okay, good. Yeah. I agree. Even though I'm a Flames yeah. fan, I agree. Play, yeah, Flames <laughs> fan. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I, yeah. I just – I again, go back to your best players. Got to be your best players. And I look at Calgary outside of Kachuk, who as a Kings fan I hate, but also love <laughs> them. Um, their high-end guys just didn't seem to be – Gio wasn't having a great year. Um, Gaudreau didn't seem to be as dynamic as he's been in the past. Their best players – are their best players. And they're not only their best players, they're the league's best players. Yeah, I know, especially with your best player only having 47 goals or points in the season with Kachuk. I don't think that you can do that compared to Drysaddle and McDavid, who both almost have 100 points. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'd, playoff hockey gets a little different, and Kachuk might – he could wreck McDavid or Drysaddle. Like, you know, like just the way he plays, he gets under skin and stuff like that. I mean, he could be the X factor. But I think I'm, t I'm taking the Oilers as of now. Yeah, I just I look at how the Flames played against Colorado last year. They were slower than the opposition, obviously. And Edmonton's a very fast team. So I just think that the fact that they can outskate them is a huge thing. And Johnny Goudreau tends to choke in the playoffs. So. Which is why I would price a premium on those top centers too, right? Yeah. I think your best players are all in the wing or defense. I think you need those two down the middle pieces to – drive those lines all right so uh something that we've been in debate uh all of us mike and tyler and uh justin who's uh not joining us tonight uh we have had a pretty much a season-long debate until the season got uh postponed who do you have in your stanley cup final this year assuming the season comes back that is yeah i like boston I don't want to like Boston, but <laughs> um, yeah, that top line is just 
it's something else. They've got consistent goaltending. They're a strong defensive team. They're that um, they're able to play that heavy hockey with enough speed to back it up too, which is you know one of those things where you go back to those Kings Cup runs and that they were heavy teams and they'd slow other teams down and their forecheck was dominant and but then speed takes so much a part of the game today and so Boston in the East, I say Edmonton in the West. <laughs> and which hockey is still going on? Come on, I'm going to take that. I'm going to take that back. <laughs> yeah. I almost had it there. Colorado fully healthy. Because <laughs> they will be fully healthy if it comes back. back. Yeah. You know what? I might go with the Avalanche. And who do you have winning that series? My brother's an Avs fan, so I'll say the Avalanche. <laughs> I personally think a sneaky team would have been Dallas. Yeah, me and Tyler agreed on Dallas last week. Yeah, I don't know. I just their top players have a way of going away. Yeah, I noticed that too. But I like their decor, and they got the goalie. The goalie tandem, not even yeah. just one. They got two. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, definitely an interesting playoffs if everybody's healthy for sure. You guys still got me. Yep. You still got you. Yep. Um. Uh, if any, if either of you guys have any more questions, we can move on to our uh, our last little topic here. I think I'm good. I think I'm good. good. All right, so we're gonna move into um, well, since teams you know aren't playing hockey right now, uh, I guess we'll grade each Canadian team this season. Tyler, you want to start us off? Are we going number one first or number seven? Um, I don't know. You pick. Let's go with one. Let's go with one and then go down. Okay. I'll bring up the list. <laughs> no, I don't need a list. I just feel like I'm going to be biased, but okay. <laughs> I'll go with Edmonton at the top. I think they are turning the corner at the right time, and they got arguably the best uh, – it's a top three forward roster of the Canadian teams. Yeah, no, I have to agree with you. Edmonton is the best team. I just think that the way they were built and the way that they're continuing to build their team, bringing in Athena CU, bringing in Ennis, and just kind of bolstering that offense – kind of takes away the whole fact that it's just McDavid and Dreisaitl. I think that they also – they need a little help on the when it comes to goaltending, but I think eventually they'll get that goalie that is consistent, and I think once that happens, I think this team can only go up and up. Josh? Um, I was actually going to pass it on to Jordan, come, come oh, back to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm in agreement. Edmonton is the number one Canadian team right now. Josh? Yep, I don't have anything to add. Edmonton's number one. Okay, I'll go to number two then. Um, this might shock some people, but I'm going to go with uh, Vancouver. Interesting. After, after that take of you saying they're going to collapse? <laughs> I just thought they were riding a hot goalie, but if you look at their forward group, they got a really skilled top six. They Quinn Hughes on the back end. They actually got a pretty young decor as well. And then Markstrom and Demko in the pipes is a pretty good, solid foundation to build with. See, I personally have the Leafs second. I think that they have so much offensive power, and once they finally get their crap together and they're fully healthy, I think this offense is only going to go where Matthews takes them, and I think he's only going to improve as his career goes on. He might win some Richard trophies, and I just think they have the goaltender as well, and I think this team can only get better and better. So, sorry, are we talking about who is the best right now? Like, if yeah. you're putting yeah. head-to-head, or if you're like, okay, which organization? would you like to okay yeah we'll go ahead to head first yeah Tyler that's ridiculous then Vancouver's you want to talk about their top six forwards and how good they are look at Toronto like literally yeah filled yeah. with superstars their defense core is not great but arguably as good as Vancouver's and their goaltending yeah. situation I mean I, I gotta go Toronto ahead of ahead of Vancouver I, I like Vancouver in the three spot but Toronto is just that top six is ridiculous ridiculously good. Yeah. And I know they didn't perform up to expectation through the regular season so far, but at some point they got to get it going and it's, they're just way too good. Definitely. No yeah. Oh yeah. I probably would have put Toronto there, but then like you just said, if we're focusing on right now, I probably could switch those. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of, I'm kind of in agreements looking back like on the season almost I'd uh, I wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't put Vancouver over Toronto just because Toronto still has all that star power, right? And they were still playing decently for the most part. But 
everybody just expected Vancouver to completely tank and be nobody this year, right? So they did a great job of certainly turning uh, turning opinions around with that. But, yeah, I, I think I'd, I'd have to put Toronto over Vancouver. All right, Tyler, you can now talk about Toronto since you messed up too. <laughs> uh, I like their forward card, like Jordan just mentioned there. I think their defense, it might just be a systemic thing. I think they have the pieces. Their right side might be a little weak, but Freddie Anderson's one of the most consistent goalies in the league. Yeah, I'm going to go with Vancouver at three. I think kind of what you said already, and I think that JT Miller was one of the best offseason moves they had, and I think the fact that they brought him in and he's been so good on that first line, I just think that that's going to help them for the next couple of years here, and I think they played fantastic this year, but still wouldn't have him over trial. Over to you, Jordan. Yeah, I'm just – I'm debating Winnipeg and Vancouver right now because I like Winnipeg's forward group a lot. I just – their defense is, is terrible. Hellybuck is just – he win you a game, but then he's also had some stretches this year where he yeah. just isn't that good. I think I'm still going to take Winnipeg over Vancouver. I know I said I'd take Vancouver over Calgary at three, but I think, I think Winnipeg's three. Yeah, no, I had Winnipeg. I had Hellebuck on my fantasy team, and one week he'd get me two shutouts. The next week he would lose me the week. It was just <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> Josh, your third. Ah, uh, yeah, for three, I don't know. I'm for three. I'm kind of in a three-way tie almost between Calgary, Winnipeg, and Vancouver. Calgary definitely being on the lower end of that. But yeah, I I'm kind of with Jordan there. I really like Winnipeg. I like Winnipeg's offensive line. I. I have nothing negative to say about Hellebuck other than, yeah, he's got his off game. But, yeah, at the same time, Vancouver still is turning a lot of heads. So I might go with Winnipeg, actually. I respect it. I like it. What number am I on now, Mike? Four or five? Four. Four, four okay. I think I went – okay. Yeah, so four would be Winnipeg for me. I was considering Calgary here. I just think they're a little bit inconsistent, although they do have the pieces. But then again, like you said, that top six in Winnipeg, I think uh, Liney, Shifley, Wheeler, Kyle Connor has been really good this season. I think it's just too much to handle. Yeah, I got to agree with that. I think, I think Calgary's the more balanced team, but I think Winnipeg was still the better team this season. And I think the fact that they shocked a lot of people this year with the way they played, losing Buffalo and losing Truba, losing basically their whole offensive, their whole defensive decor, I think the way that Hollabuck and their offense played this season, I think makes them deserve number four over Calgary. Definitely. Who's next, Josh? Uh, take it away, Jordan. I think, yeah, again, good young team. They've got the right pieces. They've got a future superstar in Pedersen, current superstar in Pedersen. Good young defense. I, yeah, Vancouver to me is the number four. Josh? Well, as a uh, part of the Resident Flames fans, I despise, I think I despise Vancouver more than I despise Edmonton. <laughs> but that's just me. I, 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 hate, I hate admitting when Vancouver's good, but man, Vancouver just turned so many heads this year and completely changed people's minds about them. Like they, people were maybe a couple months before the uh, the season was postponed was a lot of people were actually taking Vancouver like, Oh, you know, maybe they make, might make playoffs, you know, second round. And Calgary just, Calgary was so inconsistent. Like they, one game they'd be, you could say they're the best team in the league and then the next game they're terrible. Right. Maybe that might be an exaggeration, but they were good and they were great when they were great. But when they were terrible, then my goodness, they were bad. So I, it's a it's close, but I gotta give it to Vancouver. I guess that leads us back to uh, number five. I think we all have Calgary in this spot, right? Yeah, I think yeah. Uh, it's a very balanced team, but I just think that Johnny and Monty have a, just had a huge off year this year, and I think the fact that your best players aren't being your best players anymore really stopped this team from being on the top of the Pacific again. Just the fact that they had to rely on David Riddick so much on the defensive side. I just think that that team, that's why Riddick had that fall off halfway through the season. They just worked him so hard. 
I just think that the defense needs to figure itself out a little bit more. And obviously our offensive stars have to be our offensive stars. So we all have, we all have Calgary. Yeah, I think we all got Calgary. Yeah, and five. another thing I'd add there, I think I don't think Monaghan's a top line center. I think he's a second no. line center. But once you have two second line centers and him and Backlund, you need that middle guy to step up at some point. I mean, I think six and seven are pretty neck and neck. Not really. Pretty obvious. <laughs> um, I take Ottawa in the six spot. I just I think they're better set up. They're younger. Montreal. A I hate Montreal since nineteen fifty three. Sure. <laughs> I, I just – I don't think there's anything to like about that organization. You've got a goalie who, I mean, he could be one of the best in the league. He's paid like one of the best in the league, but he certainly doesn't always perform like one of the best in the league. It's – and, like, just tell me what you like about the Montreal Canadiens. Like, find something. Like, at least with Otto, you can be like, hey, they banked some picks. Hey, they've got some young guys in trades. Hey, they've got some prospects. Hey, they've got some ta- – like, you know, they've got something along the way. Mm-hmm. Montreal has been in their wheels trying – continue to fight for a playoff spot or try to stay competitive and it's a losing battle yeah i I definitely think that uh carry price is one of the more overrated goalies in the league i think he's paid like a great goalie and i still think he's a good goalie but i think for example the playoff the player poll last week they had like 46 percent of the players said he was the best goalie in the league which i don't think he's the best goalie in the league by any subs or anything (laughs) it was an interesting thing I heard I think it was Ray Ferraro mentioned it like a few months ago like right back around trade deadline or whatever it was and uh, he just said he's like why why would anybody in the NHL pay 10 million plus for a goalie a year now when the league on a yearly basis is doing everything they can to eliminate that position they want goals they want offense and they're twisting the rules and, and he said he's like who's the last guy that had like back-to-back standout years where he was like a best candidate and you know, like Pecorine's off and on, Heliobuck's off and on, you know, like there's like E. Carey Price off and on. There's not a lot of goaltenders in the NHL that are worth that money. Look at Florida gave all that money to Bobrovsky. And I mean, he was, he was the guy. He was the free agent to go after. He was worth the big contract. And it was just such an interesting point. I hadn't thought about that. I was like, you're right. Like paying goaltenders big dollars, they may deserve it. They're great athletes, but you're playing in a league that does not want them to succeed and is doing everything it possibly can. Definitely. And you've seen the league, like a lot of teams shift to like more of a tandem, I'd say. So get maybe two guys that can put up like a 915 at two, three, four mil each, maybe it's a lot more better money wise than paying one goalie 10 mil. Well, that's why the Islanders and the stars are so successful. They have two goalies. They're balancing them both out. They both have 920 save percentages on both sides and they're, obviously look fantastic. Like, obviously, they're both defensive-oriented teams, but I think that their goalies are taking them where they want to go, and that's because they're more rested. Definitely. And you can even look at Boston there. I know Tuca's making, like, seven, seven and a half mil, but you got Halak on a really good contract that's taken over when he's gotten injured, when he's been playing bad. You can't – and even Florida right now, I think they're relying on Chris Drieger, some AHL goalie that they called up. I don't know. I think they could have out – He's playing better than Bobrovsky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. And I'm pretty sure they were told by – I read something somewhere that they are told by ownership to, like, shed a lot of money into this upcoming off season. So it seemed like that might have been a waste. Yeah. Well, Florida had a bit of a tough go, too. Whenever they, whenever they were getting goals, Bobrovsky wasn't playing. But whenever they weren't getting goals, you know, Bobrovsky was playing out of his mind. And, and the team just, I don't know, couldn't get it done. All right, just to kind of do one last segment, going off of Bobrovsky, if they were to trade Bobrovsky, where, they, where would they trade him? Nowhere. I don't, I don't think they'd trade Bobrovsky. I don't think they could move him. Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, really I don't. see. Oh, yeah, sorry, Jordan, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Think... Contract. Yeah, I, one of the rumors I whole thing is that they might, coming out of it, give everybody, every team in the NHL one buyout that's not going to affect the cap or anything. It's a free buyout coming out because the cap's not going to go up much because of the finances and COVID-19 and, you know, just Florida buy them out, right? Like, wouldn't you? If you were Florida and you had a chance to redo that deal and just get rid of that contract, don't you buy out Bobrovsky and let him try the market somewhere else? You oh, 100%. Do. Yep. 100%. And I don't think it's a bad deal. There's, I, is there anybody that needs to get to the floor? 
Yeah, I guess maybe. Even then, I don't think you're looking for a return, like you said. You're just looking to get some team to the floor and cheap acquisition. And then one last one last thing is uh, we were talking about Taylor Hall and how Arizona might have made a mistake for trading for him because he's definitely not re-signing there. Um, where do you think he'll go? I think he goes to Calgary. Ooh. He's so from who- Calgary. That's, that's, I mean, to me, that makes the most sense. They've got he, He's got a little bit more experience than a couple of those guys, not a whole lot. But uh, I, I think like he changes that forward group pretty dynamically. You get a lot more. And, and plus, like if you're Calgary, and I don't know, Josh, you probably know a whole lot more about their cap situation roster and stuff than I would. But like I've heard the rumors out there that they're looking to move somebody, whether yeah. it's the drill, rumors are dancing out there. Any team with that much potential just doesn't perform. Somebody's got to go and move somebody out. How do you not bring him in? I mean, yeah, how exactly. is I mean, you can start changing around a whole lot quicker if you can bring somebody like him in. Yeah, 100%. I, I don't – I absolutely agree that they probably should move somebody. For me, it's Monaghan. I, I don't know. I have tried to be a Monaghan guy forever, and he just doesn't perform. So yeah. I would move Monaghan and, yeah, and try and go for Hall. See, the thing with me, though, is that if you're going to go for a left wing, I wouldn't get rid of your center. I'd get rid of Goudreau, who's your left yeah, wing. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Goudreau, I would sorry. go left wing for left wing. And I yeah. think Hall is just a bigger version, and I think he'll be better. On another point, though, if you were to bring in Hall, and Josh was mentioning trading Monaghan, would you move Elias Hindle- Lindholm to the middle? Oh, that could Why be not? too. Because then you could throw Kachuk, and then I guess maybe one of Goudreau or – I'm trying to look who else he is my have here on the right wing. I can't find – maybe Dubé or Mangiapane moved to the right side there. That could work. Yeah, I'd move Dubé. Looks like they have a lot of forwards tied up next year, but like you said, you're, they're going to have to move somebody. Yeah. Especially if they want to make a splash in free agency. What do you think of Michael Backlund? 31 years old, 5.35 for the next, I think, five years. Are you asking me? Anybody in general. Okay. That seems like a hefty contract for a second or third liner at this point. He's getting older, isn't he, too? Yeah, he's 31. I would, I'd say you keep him just for his, um, his play on the PK. I think he's really good on the PK, I think. Oh, yeah, unreal. On the, like, on you the, can throw unreal. him on the third line if you could bring in a first or second line center, and you can play him on the third line, let him do his thing offensively on the PK, and just let him do whatever he wants. Yeah, I, I would keep him in Calgary. I would do my best to keep him in Calgary as long as he wants to be in Calgary. Right on. Um, as to answer for your Taylor Hall question, I would say Colorado. They have a lot of space. I think they can add a premier asset here. I don't know if it'd be a long-term deal. I think that's the best place you could go for a cup. Just it suits his style, I think. They play a pretty high-speed game. They got the talent. I think he would have to sign a three- or four-year deal just because they have do have McCarr coming up, I believe, and some other extensions they have to do. I think Nathan McKinnon's up in two to three years. Yeah, you so. could definitely sign up for a bridge if you wanted. That's if he wants it, though. Right? Like he's 29. I think he was just he's just coming off a six million dollar contract. It's really all about what he wants in this offseason. Does he want to get that guaranteed money on a long term deal, or is he chasing the cup? He's only had five playoff games. He's got to make that decision. Yeah, no. If he, if he goes to the Avalanche, it's game over. If they're winning the cup. Doesn't matter. <laughs> what can happen? All right, and I think on that note, we can wrap this up. Thank you guys for yeah. watching and listening. Thank you for Jordan for coming on with us. Yeah, thank you very much, Jordan. Thank you very much for taking some time out of uh, out of your Monday here. It's Monday, right? <laughs> yes. I believe so. At this point, stuck I don't even know. I'm stuck inside so long, you forget what day it is. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. And any last words from anybody? Uh, just subscribe. Yeah, hit the subscribe button, like. Do all the things, and we will see you all later. Oh, hold on before we end. Uh, for, for the folks at home, uh, Jordan, where can the folks at home find you online? Twitter, oh, that's fair. wherever? At Jordan CJOC on Twitter. That's about it. Perfect. <laughs> all right, Sounds good. Cool. And on that note, we will see you guys all later.